Okay, welcome to this CEDAR event. This is our third event focusing on chat, GPT, and other interesting software that has developed. And I'm very pleased to welcome Mike Sharples, who I believe is the best person in the UK to talk about these things at the moment. Given his career, I would highlight he wrote the best book on writing that I've read in terms of the process of writing. Um, he's written quite a lot on pedagogy, through his work with the Open University, and in particular, I think that's the that's the last one you've put out, isn't it, Mike? Yes. Michael Pedagogy, which we can thoroughly recommend. And of course, the book that really kind of sets the scene for this webinar, which is Story Machines, again, which we can thoroughly recommend. So he is the <coughs> ideal presenter for this occasion. So I will hand directly over to Mike Sharples. But before I do that, I just better say we've put you on mute. Please put questions in the chat because there's quite a lot of us. So we'll organize questions through the chat and I will introduce them as soon as Mike finishes. So over to Mike Sharples. Well, that's great. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you for the plug for my books. And it's it's wonderful to see so many people here. And I hope at some point we can all meet in person. So I'm going to talk about generative AI for academic writing and assessment. I know that you've already had a background to uh, chat GPT and AI language generators. So I'm going to skip over that very briefly um, for people who uh, may not have had that background. But most of the uh, session is going to be about um, this. So these are the headlines that you, I'm sure, will have seen. Um, chat GPT, a threat to higher education, the college essay is dead, universities start revamping how they teach, Australian universities return to pen and paper exams. It's, you know, it seems like a huge threat to education. And uh, it's certainly going to disrupt education. But what I want to try and do is to get behind the headlines and talk about some of the issues and also particularly the opportunities. So let's get started. What I'd like to start with is this student essay, because I'm going to be using it as an example um, over the next few minutes. So I'd like you to have a look at it and just imagine that you know this was a student who was uh, submitting an essay to you. How would you assess it? Uh, what sort of um, what sort of mark might you give it? What sort of feedback? So I'll give you a couple of minutes to have a look at that and to see how you might assess that assignment. For this month. It would be an Can on everybody make sure they're muted, please? Yeah. Because we're getting so, a bit of interference. Um, yeah, I think I'm pretty much up to Paula, it. could you yeah, please mute yours? Give me one second. Okay, thank you. So just, just have a look at that essay, just for a, a couple of minutes and say, yeah. what kind of mark might you give? What kind of feedback might you give to the student? Mm. Okay. Sorry, there's still background noise. Could the host maybe mute people? All right. <clears throat> well, as you probably imagined, that student essay was entirely generated by an AI program. It was generated by GPT-3 from the OpenAI company. And the interface to it is very simple. Uh, <clears throat> you just get a, a screen there where you type in instructions to it. I typed in write a high quality essay with academic references and evidence from research studies that critiques learning styles. And then I gave it the introduction to that essay because the construct of learning styles is problematic because I press the submit button and it generated the rest. 
including the paragraphs, the references in neat APA format. So that's what GPT-3 does. And just one slide about GPT-3. It's a highly trained text completer and style copier. Unlike the sort of text completers on your mobile phone, it can look back over the last 750 words and it can generate up to 3000 words. It can write in any style in multiple languages. You can give it a direct instruction as I did. It can summarize a scientific article in simpler language, write a review, translate languages, answer questions. In essence, it's a general purpose language tool. And ChatGPT is a conversational agent based on GPT-3. It's one you can have a dialogue, a conversation with. And just to complete, Bing AI from Microsoft. Microsoft has invested $11 billion in um, Tap GPT, and <clears throat> one of its first products is uh, its Bing uh, search engine. It's added Chat GPT, and uh, in particular, it's added the ability to include links to other web pages in it. On the right hand side, you can see an example of my interaction with Chat GPT, um, asking it about um, plagiarism and AI. So I asked, is the use of chat GPT considered to be plagiarism? And it comes back not just with a, you know, a sentence, but a couple of reasonably well argued paragraphs. And then I followed that up uh, and just have a look at how I followed it up. I said, how would I know the source of information since it has been trained on millions of texts? So it, I can refer back to what's already been written. You know, I can use the word it to refer back to chat GPT. We can carry on the conversation. And that's what makes it so powerful that you don't have to restate your question every time. You could have what feels like a natural conversation with it. Okay. So students are already using GPT-3 and chat GPT for exams. Um, there's been very little um, hard evidence, but this is one that was a survey of uh, 4, 000, over 4,000 students at Stanford University. And this was back in November last year. Um, so when ChatGPT was only just being introduced and the students were asked, did you use ChatGPT on any full quarter final assignments or exams? So you know, summative assessed um, assignments and a quarter of them back in November, we're already using ChatGPT um, or GPT-3 for their final assignments. So it's clear that students are using these tools already. And in a sense, AI is democratizing cheating. That you know, in the past, if you wanted to cheat on your exams, you had to pay somebody a fair amount of money to write your assignment for you. Now you could type um, the assignment to title into ChatGPT or GPT-3, press the button and it writes it for you. A couple of notes on um, plagiarism and detecting. Firstly, plagiarism detectors, uh, traditional plagiarism detectors don't work because, and this is important, the text is generated, not copied. You can take any sentence from that essay that I showed you, put it into Google search, and you won't find uh, any other use of that sentence. It's original text. So it's generating the text based on having been fed with millions of web pages, books, articles from um, the web, and it's processed those, and now it's generating original text. Now, there is a, a new type of AI um, detector. And I'll just say a few words about those. They work in a completely different way from plagiarism detectors. So plagiarism detectors try to find an original source. They look on the web and try to find an original source, an original reference, and then highlight that uh, in the student's writing. AI detectors are, are basically pattern matches. They look through the text um, that a student submits and tries to find a pattern which suggests it's been generated by AI. And the basic premise is that AI writes in a more uniform style and humans tend to write in a more varied style. 
And so it's using this pattern matching to check whether it's been written by AI. And fortunately, um, at the moment, and probably into the future, they have fairly low reliability. The OpenAI company, which uh, is a company that um, has produced ChatGPT, has uh, circulated its own detector tool, partly just to show how reliable or unreliable they are. And it's made that very clear. So at the moment, OpenAI's own detector tool labels 9% of human written text as written by AI. So what that means is if you had 10 students who submitted essays, all written by themselves, one of those would be wrongly classified as being written by AI. Just as an exercise, I took that example AI generated essay and put them into two detectors, the open AI one and another one called GPT-0 that's had quite a bit of publicity. Both of them classified my AI generated text as being mostly human written. So they are not very accurate at the moment. Now, you may have heard that Turnitin also, um, the Turnitism in plagiarism detector company, has also um, announced a new writing detector. And it claims that there is less than 1% false positives. In other words, only one in 100 essays that was actually written by a human student is misclassified as AI. But a couple of things to note. Um, it's been trained specifically on academic writing. So you know, it's, it's taken GPT-3 uh, and then given it extra training for academic writing. The claims at the moment are based on its own lab tests. So it's based on how the, our detection technology is performing in our lab and with a significant number of test samples. It hasn't been tested in the field. Um, and it's, you know, it really needs to be tested in the field and needs to be independently verified. The other point to note is that it requires the students to submit a writing sample on at the beginning of their class. So every student has to submit a sample of their writing so that it's trying to match the, um, the student essay, not only against the AI, but also against the student's writing sample. Now, as you can imagine, this raises a, you know, a whole number of issues like, um, does the student write in a, um, in a uniform and predictable way? Uh, is the student going to be writing in the same style for um, one uh, academic essay compared with another one or one topic compared with another one? So there are a whole lot of issues and claims that need to be verified um, to see whether this sort of detector is going to be accurate. So that's AI writing detectors. Let's go back to that example that um, I gave you, the example essay generated by GPT-3. And let's look at it in a bit more detail. So firstly, on the surface, it's pretty impressive. This flawless grammar, the spelling, the spelling is accurate, and it has all the elements of um, a piece of academic writing. There's an introduction, it's divided into paragraphs, there are headings, there, at the, in the middle of it, there are examples, there's a progression, there are citations, there's a conclusion, and there are a set of references at the end in appropriate style, APA style. So it looks like an academic essay. But then we look at it in more detail and look at that second paragraph and the last sentence of that second paragraph. For example, a meta-analysis by Pashler et al. found no clear evidence that learning style interventions led to improved learning outcomes. And a further meta-analysis by Kiger et al. found no reliable link between learning style preferences and performance. Okay, two um, research studies that it cites. I tried to find um, the Kiger et al. study, and it doesn't exist. There was been no study by Kiger et al. into learning styles. 
And if you look at the reference at the end to that, Eager, Lomax and Ross, that paper doesn't exist. There is a journal, Educational Research Review, but there's no paper by Kiga, Lomax and Ross published in 2018 on learning styles. So GPT-3 and ChatGPT invent academic studies, invent references. Why would they do that? Well, in short, the answer is because we asked them to. So I said, write a high quality essay with academic references and evidence from research studies. So it generates that research study from Pachler et al. And then since it was asked to provide research studies plural, it then tries to generate another research study in the same style. And um, it does that just by copying the previous style. As a system, it doesn't know that that's not something you should do as an academic. It's a style copier. It's not a, a, a um, it's not an academic, um, uh, it's, it's not an academic reference. So generative AI hallucinates. Uh, that's a term that's being used by some people to describe this phenomenon. It doesn't know that it shouldn't invent research studies because it's got no internal explicit model of how the world works. So it doesn't know that that's not something an academic should do. Also, it can't access current information. So it was trained um, on uh, this data from the web up to 2021. It has had some additional training, but the basic training of it, the basic data underlying it, goes back to 2021. And fundamentally, in human terms, it's amoral. Um, it doesn't know right from wrong. And that's not just a fault of it. That's part of its uh, basic functioning. It's a language machine. It's not a database or a reasoning system. And you know, if you see anybody describing it as a database or an AI database, that's false. It's not. It's a language machine. And just to give you, you know, another example, if you see on the top right there, I asked it to write a brief history of AI language generators. And this is just one paragraph from it. Almost every fact in that paragraph is wrong. So if you just take the last sentence of it, other AI language systems developed during this time included the PARI program, which was able to pass the Turing test. No, it couldn't. And the SIC knowledge base, which was used to develop the Winograd schema challenge. No, it didn't. Almost all of those facts are wrong. But you would need to be an expert to know that. On the surface, it looks plausible. So if you like, these systems generate sometimes, not always, sometimes plausible hallucinations. Now, the OpenAI um, company has been quite upfront about that. Um, you can look at one of these blogs from the OpenAI company. Under limitations, despite making significant progress, our Instruct GPT models are far from fully aligned or fully safe. They still generate toxic or biased outputs, make up facts, and generate sexual and violent content without explicit prompting. Now, <clears throat> to give AI its due, firstly, they have made that absolutely clear from the beginning, the limitations of its system. And secondly, they have done uh, additional training of the system um, to try and um, remove or to tone down these uh, inappropriate outputs. And also they've basically put language filters in place so that if it generates um, any um, inappropriate language, that will be, um, it, basically that output will be stopped uh, and it will regenerate it. So it's done its best as a company to try and ameliorate, to try and reduce the, um, the hallucinations and the problems, but they are still there. So what, you know, as academics, as institutions, what should we do? Well, I think, you know, there are three approaches. Firstly, we could ban it. Uh, and uh, certainly some universities have already attempted to do that. New York City. Um, uh, the difficulty, I think, is that 
comp it's kind of going to be discriminatory. Confident, confident students will continue to use AI uh, for, for their essays, for their assignments, either in part or in whole, and they will challenge the decisions based on AI detectors. Because in essence, it's um, academics or institutions using an AI detector to detect an AI generator. It's pitting one AI system against another, and that um, there are going to be all sorts of issues, legal issues and ethical issues of students who say, no, I did write that essay, uh, and you have to prove that I didn't. So I think there will be many issues, even if you have more accurate um, uh, detector systems, uh, that will mean that confident students will still continue to use the AI and will challenge decisions. You could attempt to evade it, then, you know, Going back to pen and paper, invigilated exams, they're costly and limited. Um, or we can adapt. And re adapting obviously requires new methods of assessment, new policies and guidelines. And this is where I think we have to rethink assessment. But let's look at the other side of it. The generative AI can be an empowering and a joyful tool for creativity. And, and I really do urge you to, to get your hands dirty and to try it. It's free to use, um, chat GPT. You can go onto their website and literally you just start chatting with it. So you know, rather than hear about this in abstract, I do recommend that you try it for yourself. Here are just a couple of examples. So and, and the, all these examples I've generated myself. Uh, so this one with, uh, with GPT-3, write, write an outline plot for a novel about a man and a woman who discover true happiness by living together as fantasy characters. And it comes back with a, a reasonable outline for a novel or a short story. On the right hand side, um, write a lesson plan for a 90 minute introduction to Spanish for beginners aimed at children aged 10, format the lesson as a table. And that's what it comes back with, a neatly formatted table, giving step by step a lesson plan for a Spanish lesson for beginners. And then I asked it, um, revise the 90 minute lesson plan to make it more fun and engaging. And immediately it came back with a revision of that lesson plan um, to uh, improve the engagement uh, and the enjoyment of it. So you don't just have to accept what Chuck GPT comes back with the first time, you can have an intelligent discussion with it uh, to, uh, to argue with it, as you'll see, or to get it to enhance its response. So here are some ways that you can explore assessment for learning with generative AI. So these, <clears throat> again, examples that I've generated so the first possible way is that the educator or the student uses AI to generate multiple responses to an open question. So sets an open question and then gets the AI to generate a number of responses. And then each student synthesizes and critiques the AI responses to create their own written answer. So the example I gave up here um, from, uh, from a uh, exam paper for students, um, in what way is Marx's theorizing still re relevant to international relations? And you can see the top two, I <clears throat> typed in exactly the same prompt and it came back with different responses. I then tried changing the prompt slightly. So <clears throat> I changed it to, does Marx's theorizing still have relevance to international relations? Show how you arrived at your conclusions. And in general, if you ask it to show its working or show how you arrive at its conclusions, it will produce a longer response. Now, this is something called prompt engineering. Um, and prompt engineering is one of these terms, one of these skills that has just emerged in the last two months. Prompt engineering, in essence, is giving the right instructions to chat GPT or to an AI generator. And there is an art uh, and a skill to it. And you know, literally now there are um, job applications and um, job adverts for prompt engineers. 
But, <clears throat> but if you want to you know, have a try at prompt engineering, just try uh, giving a straightforward instruction and then try expressing it in different ways, particularly saying, show how you arrive at your conclusions and see what it comes back with. So that's one. Another one uh, way in which you might use assessment for learning with generative AI is that the educator sets a project for students. And then each student uses generative AI as a tool for research. And then the student at the end writes a project report indicating the contribution of AI. <clears throat> so uh, let's say the student was being asked to do a project on the effects and consequences of introducing AI into the professional workplace. So I asked that to ChatGPT, and it came back with five reasonable responses of how AI could be introduced into the workplace. And then I asked it, please give evidence from research studies that support these conclusions. And it came back with five different pieces of evidence from research studies. Now, of course, as I've said before, and they could be incorrect. And you need to check each piece of evidence that chat GPT or GPT-3 provides because it may be wrong. But <clears throat> as a, a tool for research, then there are possibilities providing you treat it critically. And the third, and I think this is the one I like the best, um, it can be a partner in a dialogue. So you have an individual or group activity where the students engage with chat GPT in a Socratic type dialogue. So you argue against chat GPT, <clears throat> you argue one position and ask it to take the other position. And then the student writes an argumentative essay um, based on their position and chat GPT's um, position. And it's great fun. Um, for instance, I've tried arguing against it around the US and China's uh, economic system and um, asking it, so uh, is China's economic system likely to be more successful um, because it's uh, more managed and organized? It came back with a response. I <laughs> replied to that and we had um, for probably you know, half an hour a good to and fro argument. So I think you know, seeing it as a partner in an argument is uh, another constructive way to use chat GPT. So what I would say is use generative AI with care. As a database or a search engine, generative AI can be dangerous. But as a creative engine, it's powerful and fun. And I think we should start you know, rethinking these generative AI systems as creative engines. So we need to rethink written assessment now. Um, we, we, you know, we'll have to assume that students will at least to some extent be using AI to support their assessment, to, to support their writing. We should explore AI for creativity, for argumentation and for research and also introduce and negotiate guidelines for students and staff. Now, <clears throat> I tried doing that. Here is a set of guidelines for students based on best practices for using generative AI systems in education. And they're entirely generated by ChatGPT. And I wanted to do that deliberately. So rather than be my guidelines, I wanted to see what, if you like, the consensus ChatGPT guidelines would be. I've tested those um, uh, on LinkedIn and on Twitter. And generally, they seem to be pretty well received. So at least as a starting point, they're certainly better than I could have written. So as a starting point, I would recommend these as guidelines for students um, for you at least to take a look at. And what next? So just to finish off, um, it's certainly not the end. It's um, possibly the end of the beginning, um, but there's going to be plenty more uh, AI um, that's going to affect education. And just in order of uh, how soon they're going to come, here's a, a possible list. Firstly, there will very shortly be a, a whole slew of new apps 
based on interfaces to chat GPT, and also another tool that's uh, been made available by OpenAI called Whisper, which, and Whisper is a very powerful multi-language speech to text system. So you can talk to it um, in multiple dialogues, uh, multiple languages, and it will then turn that into text. So there will be, uh, expect language learning apps, quizzes, tutorials, tools for creative and for essay writing. That, you know, there will be many content providers and app providers that are producing apps based on this new interface, um, this new API to chat GPT and Whisper. Secondly, you can effect, expect AI generated video content. So it's already possible to generate an entire video with talking head, background um, illustrations uh, automatically. Um, I'll, I'll show you this. Um, it's, a, it's only a two minute video, just to, for you to get a glimpse of what's coming. Now this um, video here, it, he needed to use a number of different applications, but very shortly, you will just be able to type in the instructions and then it will automatically do the rest. So we'll just have a pause and let you have a look at this video. Hey, this is Chris from Wistia, and today on my lunch break, I'm going to make a video using nothing but generative AI. First, I need a script. I'll open up ChatGPT and prompt it with this. Write a script in the style of a YouTube video about how to make an apple pie. The video should be under 60 seconds long. The script should feel friendly in nature. Now, I've been writing video scripts for over 20 years, and this thing just spit out a script in seconds, and it's actually pretty damn good. I'm blown away. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this masterpiece, and I'll open up Synthesia. I'll create a new video, and choose my own custom AI avatar that I've made. I'm gonna upload a background image for the video, and I'll move my avatar over to the side of the frame. And I'll make avatar me just a bit smaller. In Synthesia, along with my custom avatar, I also have a custom voice print, which will basically turn text into my own voice. Scary? Yeah, a bit, but let's hope this doesn't fall into the wrong hands. Anyway, now all I have to do is copy the script that was generated by ChatGPT and head up to click Generate. This will take a few minutes, so I'll, I'll go ahead and grab some water. Okay, my avatar is ready. So let's take a peek at a quick sample. Hey there. In this short video, I'm going to show you how to make a delicious apple pie. Okay, this is not great. And it's quite disturbing to me personally. I mean, I see me and hear me, but it's not me. It actually kind of makes my skin crawl, to be honest. But I think I can guzzy this video up with some B-roll to take the emphasis off of AI avatar me. So I'll download the video and open up Descript. I'll upload my video, and the software will automatically transcribe my video back into text. Transcribing. Now I can highlight the moments of my video that I want to visualize, like this line, how to make a delicious apple pie. I'll head into their footage tab and type in apple pie and select the clip. This one works well. I'll do that for some other lines in the video and choose some nice looking stock footage clips. When I'm done, I'll hit export, which will take a couple minutes. All right, here is my new AI generated video about how to make a great apple pie. As a video producer of over 20 years, does this put me out of a job? Don't you mean extinct? Let's roll the video to find out. Hey there. In this short video, I'm going to show you how to make a delicious apple pie First, preheat your oven to 375 degrees. Next, roll out your pie crust and place it in a pie dish. In a separate bowl, mix together sliced apples, sugar, cinnamon, and a pinch of salt. Pour the mixture into the pie dish, making sure to evenly distribute the apples. Cover the pie with a second pie crust and use a fork to press the edges together and create a decorative border. Use a knife to make a few slits in the top of the pie crust to allow steam to escape. Date the pie for 45 minutes, or until the crust is golden brown. And that's it. Your apple pie is ready to be enjoyed. 
Thanks for watching and happy baking. Now, I'm not trying to say that these AI tools will totally replace human creativity and storytelling. And as you can see, the tech does have some room for improvement. I'm going to show you how to make a delicious apple pie. Apple pie. Apple pie. But this stuff can be used today to help bring your vision to life. So what do you think? Is this the future of content creation? Or will it be a dystopian reality to the likes of which we've never seen? Okay, so um, that's one glimpse into the near future. He had to use a number of different apps, but very soon you'll just type in the instructions and it will create the entire talking head video and the background images. Next, I think, along the line is topical generative AI. Um, so as I said, the ChatGPT was trained up to uh, 2021. What will happen is that um, AI language generators will be combined with search engines so that they can report on current events and on, on their online experience. And further on down the line is common sense generative AI. And that's going to be a lot more difficult because it means bringing together two different sorts of AI, the sort of neural network, data-rich AI, and the older type symbolic AI that can do um, common sense reasoning. There are projects at the moment to bring those two together, but it's very early days yet. So that, I guess, gives you some idea of what's coming on down the line. And Let me know. What you if you would like to know more, then um, Rafael Perez Perez, my colleague and I wrote a book called Story Machines. Um, that puts what I've been saying into a bigger context about um, how humans uh, are story machines themselves and how computers have become creative writers. So that's what I've got to say, and I hope it's been helpful.